Okay, we will go ahead and get started. We'll keep an eye on our waiting room and get folks in as quick as we can. Um, just wanted to let you know that Steve and I are here with the Housing Facility Services Committee, and we're going to be your host today as we kind of work through some different conversations. Um, please note that this really is conversation based. And so Steve and I are not here to present um, any topics today. We are really here just to facilitate some conversation among the group on different things that we feel are relevant right now. Um, and so please join us um, and don't feel that we have to stick only to the questions that are visible. Um, you can, you are welcome to put in the chat or um, give us some other indication of other topics that you would like to talk about. Um, the first thing we wanted to put on folks ra uh, radar is that we are coming close to our fall housing facilities conference. It will be hosted virtually this year and that is October 21 and 22. If you have questions about the conference or interested in participating with that um, subcommittee group, I've provided the information for JJ and for Aubrey who are leading that team and so would encourage you to reach out to them if you have that interest. Um, also would encourage um, your connection with us in the communications area. So if you want to make sure you, oops, sorry, if you want to make sure that you are um, part of our mailing lists and things of that nature, if you would like to reach out to Joel or complete that committee interest form, um, that will make sure that we keep you connected with the general group, but also um, with some of our subcommittees. And I will work to get that link in the chat if I can during this session. I um, also want to make sure we draw attention to the online community app for those who don't want to utilize it from your desktop app. It is desktop, it is available in app form. All right, um, another group that we work with is the Sustainable Facilities Group. Um, and so I wanted to let folks know that the next meeting with that group led by Lisa Alexander will be taking place on October 20th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. If you are interested in connecting with that group, Lisa's email address is provided on the screen. Additionally, you can shoot me an email or put a note in the chat for me and I will make sure you get connected and get that Zoom link um, for the next sustainability meeting. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it over to our executive board liaison, Josh, um, to give us any updates he has from that team. Thanks, Teresa, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your participation ongoing in this uh, important committee. Um, I would you know, just generally from a high level, the board is in the process now of evaluating and debriefing the programs and services from the last year and determining sort of the way forward, you know, with the lens of what worked well from a remote perspective and what may uh, be more appropriate to go back in person. And so um, we'll be looking forward to that. At this point, you know, the tentative first big in-person uh, meeting for Kuhuai will be the annual conference and exposition next year. But if we've learned anything over the last year and a half, it's that everything is <laughs> up in the air until we see it, but we're feeling uh, sort of good, good about that. Um, I just would like to reiterate uh, the housing facilities conference coming up and the fact that it's online is just such a great opportunity to get team members engaged both from the facilities area, but also facilities adjacent groups like residential life and housing operations. Um, there have been a number of team passes sold for institutions and those are unlimited. So uh, you might check in with your senior housing officer to see if they've purchased a team pass and then you'd have uh, unlimited folks participate. Um, the programs have also been posted online and they look uh, really fantastic. So um, I'd welcome either in the chat or uh, if people wanna unmute, if they've got any questions for me, uh, otherwise you can email me offline. Thank you, Josh. Are there any questions for Josh? Okay, well, please do utilize the chat if you think of something um, later or Josh's information is listed there on the screen. 
I have just dropped in the chat the link to our committee interest form. And so if you or, or team members on your campus would be interested in connecting um, with other folks within the facilities area, would encourage them to just click on that link. And that allows us to make sure we stay in contact beyond some of the great communication provided by Akuho I um, through their mailings. All right, now it is time for more of the roundtable portion. Um, and like I said, this is really our time to connect as colleagues and share. And so um, would encourage your participation. Um, and we'll try to get to the topics that we've put, we've shared for today. Um, and if we don't get to all of them, the conversation continues again. All right. So the first thing we wanted to talk about today is move-in and opening. Um, some of us are well past it. Um, some of us are right up on it, move-in eve for some. And so just wanted to just see, these are some of the topics we have. What are some changes that you implemented for this year? Um, things that you already have planned for next year based on what you're seeing, all of that. So I'm gonna be quiet now. Um, and see if folks will share what your experience has been. Teresa? Yeah. I just I, I just wanted to say to all of you from, um, from a vendor end of things, um, changes for 21, which were really, I don't know if this is a surprise or not to all of you, but I will say this was the first year where I think every install we did, we ran into construction issues on, on the side of the schools. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of that has to do with what's been going on the last 18 months. But when I say every project, small, big, large, I mean, you name the, the, the description. Um, and, and that was a real surprise for us. And, and as well as another thing I, I, I really would love to hear anybody talk about is, are you guys seeing prices and things outside of just materials just skyrocketing? I mean, it, we are, we, we've never witnessed what we're going through right now on our end, trying to talk to all of you about projects for 2022 or what have you. And, and from, from our perspective as a vendor, I'm, I'm not kidding, I'm, I'm sort of scared now that we're coming to you and saying, well, here's your furniture price for next year. And somebody's gonna look at that and say, oh my God, Bill, that's, are you kidding me? Um, we're, we're nervous as a vendor on, on how we approach you, all of you in the industry. And I just wondered if, uh, if you're getting hit with things outside of, I mean, obviously we're furniture, but what else is out there? Is, is this just not furniture? Bill, I, I, hope that, I'm not, I hope I'm not off topic. No, you are absolutely on topic. Um, th this was a lot of what Steve and I and others in our last leadership meeting talked about when we kind of brainstormed what our topics today would be exactly what you you've said, because we actually have a vendor slide coming. And oh, okay. to, ex no, it's perfect, Bill. It's perfect. It's exactly to your point. So let's go ahead and open that up to folks. Um, let's talk about that. What has happened on our side, on the on the university side, on the building managers or owner side? What, what's happening on the construction side? Bill, I think you're finding it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm small college on the north coast of California. We're, we're kind of isolated and our, our prices are higher than normal, higher than industry standards, so to speak, or other areas of California, um, just based off our um, location. But um, everything, the prices have have gone up on not just furniture obviously you know lumber prices went through the roof um they're starting to come back down and stabilize a little bit but um plumbing um underground electrical materials and supplies wiring and stuff everything is has escalated pretty hard over the last year yeah and and that and that's i think the the part that we're, we're hearing also in, in um, even even installers trying to get quotes out for all of you type of thing for into a, a June, July, August of next year. I mean, I've seen delays too. I mean, oh my gosh, talk about, you know, it. We, we, I'm only happy we're domestic. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking, I mean, but we're, we're 100% domestic, which has helped. I mean, we didn't miss an install this year. 
but I mean, the point of it is, is just how, what you're experiencing, Steve, is exactly what we're seeing on our end too. Yeah. Well, you don't necessarily experience just on the material side. So we talk about, you know, the construction um, and the construction industry as a whole, I mean, you can't, right now you can't find enough people to do work. Right. Um, you know, I've, I've had people tell me, you know, I call up and, you know, I need a quote to, to redo this roof. Oh, okay. Well, our, our um, estimators making appointments four months out, wow. um, you know, just to get an estimate, much less and then get it scheduled if you want to do the job. And um, so trying to get, trying to get labor stocked enough um, to get anything done is just difficult. And we're right in the middle of bidding for a new creative arts building. Um, and one of the questions that the contractors asked that were pre-qualified was, okay, well, you know, are you going to allow for escalation in material costs here? Well, you know, this building is, is 100% state funded. The funding has been locked in for geez, two or three years now. So it's like, no, you're not, you're going to have to, you know, kind of calculate what you think and the, you know, the escalation charges might be, or the less escalation costs might be over the course of a year and a half construction, but you're also going to have to be really smart about how you go about building the building, you know, and, and, you know, you lock it in, you get the job and then you start ordering material um, at the prices that, you know, you've, you were locked in at to, to, to do it. So it's a real, I understand your, your, um, hesitancy because it's it's still a very volatile market right so in in regards to furniture i i know i see a lot of decision makers on this call um are you are are you in the, that role um are you scaling back what you're planning for this upcoming summer anticipating some of these increased costs are you unable to make decisions right now because of, of budgets in general. I'd be curious to hear if we've started thinking about that. You can speak up or you can use the chat. We've postponed our next round of capital um, projects or large renovations due to budget constraints and only projects that are already underway are going forward. So, and I was saying in the chat, like we can't, like appliances, they'll tell us four months, it'll be six or eight months to get them. Um, components like to even fix something like an appliance we can't get. And we're facing staffing shortages, especially in service industries, janitorial, that type of thing, but construction too. So any of our renovations or construction projects have been delayed either because they can't get staff, staff get COVID and then they're off for two or three weeks or a variety of reasons, so. And, and the other thing that we found interesting is in order to be competitive, which I'm sure for the labor, um, you know, it, we, we also, Steve, are, and, and I, Steve's not there, hopefully he can hear me, <laughs> I mean, but I mean, it's it's the, the ironic part is our one factory is in a very um, tiny, small location up in on the Lake Michigan coast, like halfway up Michigan. Not a lot of people there. So we've had to have labor increases three times um, just just to keep the people we have. And and so so, I mean, it, it's like we're talking about, well, what happens when everything comes down and wood finally settles when things happen again? And there's a certain aspect, once again, I don't know if you're experiencing this, but there's a certain aspect of this that you just don't go back to people and say, well, it looks like it's all over. We're going to cut your wages back to what they were pre-pandemic. I mean, I just, I don't think that's going to work. We know it isn't. I mean, <laughs> I have an interesting conversation. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Angela with the Bro Company as well. Um, thanks for letting us kind of, we kind of crashed the party, but thank you for including us. Um, I was at a um, procurement meeting, which we were invited by the procurement team and several questions like you all are talking about came up with them because I think the one thing is sometimes I think you all send stuff to procurement and then it's like sit around and wait or hurry up and wait kind of a situation. And so we had a lot of discussion about 
the, you know, it's in everything, relationships, personal and dating and everything, um, even at work, uh, you know, communication is the key and to just open the lines of communication um, even more so, especially um, procurement said, you know, that um, they would be a great resource in terms of getting the word out to all the colleagues on campus to say, you know, if you're thinking about a project, either order now or, you know, you may have to wait kind of a thing. So I think everyone's feeling the crunch of all this. Um, and what's really interesting too, to, to Bill's comment, is sometimes you don't know what it's gonna be. You know, for a while in our line, it was foam. And I think it's still there a little bit, but not as bad now, you know, and then it was wood. Wood's kind of settled down. So you, sometimes you just don't know what's the next thing gonna be. And the gentleman at Auburn that I spoke to in facilities, he said right now, he can't get copper to save his life. And he said, so any electrical projects are where his challenges are right now. So you just don't know what's the, what's the, um, what's missing from the day, you know, what that looks like. Um, so on that note, what are there other things? Um, we know foam has been a thing for our furniture friends. Um, now copper, um, what other things are folks hearing? Cause I, oh, one of the things I really appreciate about this group is I've kind of gotten some heads up on things we needed to be mindful of. I know, I um, can't remember when it was, but there, we were getting some scary information from our folks who help with glove supplies. And so um, that was good for us to share as a group. So what, uh, what are their things or folks hearing? I like to capitalize on your knowledge. Okay, if you think of something, feel please do share. Um, other thoughts on, on what we're hearing here from um, Bill and Angela and how we feel about that as building owners or how that's impacting our planning. Mm. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, um, anything with computer chips, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. A, Go ahead, Steve. Um, I just that's a really good point on the computer chips. Um, you know, anything with a chip in it now is like go go look for a new car. You can't find a new car. Uh, you you know, and if you can, you can buy a cheaper than you can buy a used car. Um, but they're just they're not available with with the chips, and you know, and you know, earlier on, you know, they stress the importance of just supplies especially here on the West coast, the, um, the ports, you know, last I heard last week, there's like 45, 50 ships parked outside the port in Long Beach because they can't get into offload. Um, it's just driving, just driving prices and, and delaying projects. Um, you know, Bill brings up the point on every project's been delayed due to construction. Um, that's supplies, that's um, staffing on the construction side. It's, um, you know, and it's going to drive our costs. It's going to drive our O&M costs up and it's going to drive our construction costs up. And I don't know if it's, it's definitely not going to settle back down um, to pre-COVID um, in what we had pre-COVID before this all started. So how do we, how do we, how do we really try and forecast the future as a group? And I think this group, you know, and, and the topics and the discussions that we have um, across this and across the country as a whole, because things were a lot different on the West Coast than they are on the mid East Coast or, you know, in Teresa's area there. And, you know, um, just all across, everything is so different. Um, so just to, to really stay in touch and help, you know, having these conversations so we can, so we can work together to really do the best we can in, in forecasting the future. Um, so I, I want to, we're going to, we're going to keep that piece going. And so let's go ahead and continue to use the chat, um, but want to kind of, to see if there are other, because those delays, construction delays impacted move in for some folks this year. Um, so that, that's a piece. Um, what are some things, do you anticipate, do we anticipate potentially construction impacting next move in? 
are there other things that we've seen that we're anticipating again for next year? So one of those things we've got to consider is how are these delays from construction impacting move-in? We've got to work with Bill and Angela earlier um, and be mindful of the language we choose as we're um, navigating completion dates and installation. Um, what else from move-in? How, how's occupancy? Are folks at 19 occupancy or are we still looking lighter? We're full or going to be full starting tomorrow. And I think, you know, for me already, the question on my mind regarding occupancy is what, if any, isolation and quarantine requirements will flow into the following year. And I'm, we're hoping none, but, you know, who knows? Uh, we're also... We're also full here at Binghamton in the SUNY system in New York. Um, similarly, uh, we had come into this year with like, you know, 60 beds available for quarantine isolation and had to expand with breakthrough cases to uh, bring a building we were actually taking down for renovation back online. Uh, all the furniture my staff threw out this summer. We had to scrounge out of, you know, spares and other buildings and repopulate uh, the building. So, Thankfully, my summer staff has gone back to college and on to their, you know, fall job. So uh, they didn't have to do it, which would have been like the most heartbreaking thing in the world after they spent the whole summer in a no elevator building carrying beds, desks and dressers downstairs. Um, but we're filling it back up with furniture. And uh, so we can double our, our on campus uh, IQ beds just in case, um, you know, this continues. Uh, we're pretty flat right now. We're steady um, and we're fully occupied. Uh, move in. The, the issues we had with move-in were trying to have a single checkpoint on campus to assess vaccination status of, you know, we require it in, in our uh, school, regardless of the, um, F, the, the approval uh, when we moved in in August. And um, that single checkpoint needed to move through about 2,500 people in a single day. Um, we very quickly decentralized and the exact thing we thought would happen happened and we had some unvaccinated, unverified students end up in our communities and kind of had to chase them down. Uh, it took about, you know, four or five days to get that done. So, yeah, it was a tough move in, but, uh, but we're, we're cooking now. It's, it's been okay, except for the COVID breakthrough cases. JJ, what is your plan for next fall? Will you continue to have, you anticipate you're going to continue to have some type of verification process? No, because um, the place we lived this summer was, you know, we declared in late June that our campus was going to make it mandatory for residential students to have a vaccination verified and uploaded. And so that didn't give a lot of runway for people. Um, and we know students who were totally vaccinated, got the shot last spring, just didn't do the paperwork. So we needed a place to catch them and say, okay, we need to get your documentation all set. Um, now that it's been a whole semester, we have, you know, that's a part of the housing process. And so, um, and we'll be going forward with our health services on campus. Um, so I, I don't think we're in that. We're, we can go back to our previous plan, which is to get everyone on campus and get them checked in in their communities. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Dana has shared their, in the chat, they're full, higher than pre-pandemic. That is great. And that's great for budget. So then we can buy more expensive furniture. <laughs> I'm teasing Bill. Everything, everything escalates. Um, and then Robin has shared kind of the percentage of their um, beds that they have um, set aside for quarantine and isolation. So appreciate that. If others would like to comment in the chat on what your numbers are looking like for quarantine and isolation in comparison to your campus population, um, that would be great. So folks can kind of have a point of reference there. Um, let's go ahead and um, see what other topics we've got to see if there are folk, things that folks would like to talk about. Staffing, we've started talking about this, and so we do have a poll on this. Let me give this a try. Oh, let's try. Hmm. We tested it, so I've got to see if I can. Oh, here we go. Relaunch it. Okay, so related to staffing, let's talk about rate of pay because we've all talked about our vacancy. So if you would take a moment and just comment, um, are you at market with your frontline positions? 
um, below market, above market. Um, there's just too much variance between positions. Maybe your custodial are at market, but your trades folks um, are below market, or maybe you don't know. Um, so folks would just take a second um, to think about your um, group that you work with and comment on um, current rate of pay. Give a, about 10 seconds longer for folks to think about that. And I'm going to end it in three, two, one. And we'll share our results. And so, um, so for, for our small group that participated today, um, a good number of folks are at market. Um, and so um, now we can kind of have a feel for the group today, kind of where we stand compared to our counterparts um, with rates of pay and what things look like in other areas. Uh, okay. All right, so just want some folks have talked about this. I think Dana, did you comment on staffing? Do you want to maybe talk about some of the challenges you're having and maybe some of your strategies? Well, it's it's our contract janitorial company can't get staff. And it's it's I'm in on I'm on the west coast of Canada and in a suburb of Vancouver, and it's fairly apparent in in our whole province and and the western canada that service industries in particular are can't get staff just absolutely can't get staff so our janitorial contractor has actually called the subcontractor to try and get the work covered <laughs> thankfully they're covering the residents work because it's been determined over the course of the pandemic that the residents work was essential to the university it was an essential service because we were we were there the whole time whereas nobody else were um but it it it's hard to get staff we can't get front desk staff we can't get you know just, i don't know i don't know what it is there we have a very um relatively low unemployment um but lots of empty jobs <laughs> Josh has shared they've done a pretty good job of hiring some of their custodial staff. Josh, are there any particular strategies that you've employed to have success in that area? Have yeah, you, you know, our, our mostly personal referrals and our custodial staff particularly has a lot of family connections within the, the team. And um, we also were able to hire some folks that had worked as summer housekeepers into full-time positions. So we lucked out with a sort of a ready labor pool there that isn't necessarily the case in other areas. Um, I would love for folks to comment on how you're doing in the trades area, uh, trades areas and any strategies um, that you've seen effective there. We have a number of HVAC vacancies. And I was speaking to a colleague on another campus and they've had an HVAC vacancy for five years. Um, so what are you seeing for trades? Is there a particular trade that is difficult to fill? Um, and suggest, if, if you don't, <laughs> what, what are your suggestions? I'm being selfish in asking this question. Uh, we're seeing HVAC and refrigeration, and those here at our campus are central campus positions, but same thing. They've had a running vacancy, multiple vacancies, as long as I've been here, which is 11 years. I'm so encouraged, Josh. Yeah, sorry. I mean, you know, <laughs> higher education doesn't, it doesn't quite pay market rate, at least here for those positions, and, um, you know, it, it's just so hard to, you know, we usually get people towards the end of their careers who don't want to be out in the construction market anymore.
Um, if you have some thoughts, I would welcome those in the chat. I will share a couple of things that we're doing. Um, we have, we've gotten feedback from our HR department that when folks um, apply, they're saying the biggest thing that encourages them to apply is word of mouth. And so we are working on a campaign with our staff to encourage referrals. Um, we can't do some of the things that you might see um, in the private industry with referral bonuses and sign-on bonuses. There's just so many things involved with the state institution doing that. Um, but we're looking to build some type of internal program. You know, maybe it's drawings for gift cards that we're, you know, we're funding in a different way um, to get folks to make those referrals. Our grounds team um, has, that's how they've been able to fill their positions is they've been like similar to Josh's as they've been spreading the through word of mouth. So we're working on some um, contact cards with HR where we highlight our benefits and um, have some quotes from our staff on the back and we're going to encourage folks to, to share those because um, we know we're not going to get, um, we can't compete with some of the, the um, private rates of pay, but really it is our work environment that's beneficial. Like you've said, folks that just don't want to be out in the elements, um, folks that are wanting dependable work and you don't have to worry that the, the industry is going to take a turn um, those types of things, um, and how you're treated and your leave benefits. So we're trying to find ways to, to talk about that. Um, also we're looking at our, our rates of pay, but we're limited in how we approach that. Um, and so sometimes it means that we, um, have, have to look at gapping a position and spreading that funding out between the other positions to get a more enticing rate of pay. Um, and so th those are some of the things that we're um, looking at. And so, um, but those are vacant positions. I would want to make sure I say, so I don't want folks to think, I don't, I don't want um, the wrong thing going out about Missouri State, but we're just looking at how, how, do, how can we get um, enticing with that, within our community. Um, a couple of weeks ago um, for, for one of our hospitals announced they were going to $15 an hour for starting rate of pay. Um, and then a week later, like later that week, the other hospital was like, oh yeah, $15.25. Um, <laughs> and and we're, not, we're not even at that number, honestly. Um, and we had just done an increase that we were really excited about and pleased because it was significant for us. Um, and then they just jumped ahead. And so this is not my therapy session, just sharing where we're at and what we're doing. So thoughts from others. I, I, Teresa, I just, all I wanted to say is also if somebody has advice on how to try to lure um, the younger generation into a job, I'd love to hear anybody's thoughts or advice on that too. Our, 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 people, I told all of you, we had, we've had three wage increases since COVID started, and that's to keep our current employees. That's not talking about finding new employees um, to keep from losing them, but I would, that's our single largest challenge is finding um, future workers in their 20s, their 30s. Our, our workforce is getting old, and, and so, I mean, if anybody has any thoughts or ideas on that too, or maybe a, a topic of discussion for, for another meeting, um, but I would love to hear what anybody says about that because that's my single per, personal scare as far as with two factories is, is, is trying to get young again. And, and um, that's it, that's all I wanted to add. So I guess I'm piling on trees, but no, <laughs> your thoughts. No, it's good, that's perfect, that's perfect. Um, and, and I will say one thing we're looking at now is like we're going back to our job descriptions and looking to see um, are what is what we're asking what we need. And so have we put in qualifications that we need to revisit because of what the market looks like right now? So can we require six years for an HVAC? Is that the right thing right now? Are there, is there a pool that can do that? So some things that we're looking at. Um, Bill, I think that's a great question. And I think we can definitely spend some time um, thinking about who we can tap to kind of talk about that, who can help us understand how we entice um, especially when we consider the type of work we do, because um, it is different. The types of 
um, things that we're asking, sometimes some of those things that folks talk about being enticing to this next generation become really difficult when we're looking at factory positions or HVAC or custodial. So how, what, what do we do? Um, acknowledging the differences um, in our positions. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, this was another thing that, that came up is staff morale. So, so how are your staff doing? Because we know right now it's such a competitive market. And like you've talked about, Bill, we need to keep our folks, right? And when it's difficult to fill positions and the workload isn't changing, how do we maintain morale? So what are some things that folks are doing? How do you feel your staff is doing? I've got no solution, but my staff is tired. <laughs> They're tired because every week there's a new protocol that we've got to try and manage. We have to switch on a dime and I hear other people doing the same thing. Thankfully, I haven't had to move furniture that we'd already tried to throw out or up and down in a building with no elevator, but you know, one sign goes up, oh, let's change to mask mandate. We need to go take all those down and put new ones up. And it's just on and on and on and on and on. So we're tired. I don't know what to do about it, but we're tired. <laughs> what, what would help you, Dana? I I'm still holding on to working from home one day a week and getting an extra hour of sleep. That's about all I can do. And I and my staff were working home, from home one day a week until students moved in two weeks ago. And now we, we I need them on site. So. Others, what are you doing to help your staff or what would make you feel better right now. To Robin's point in the chat, um, we're seeing that too. We're seeing a lot of uh, our campus partners and people across our campus sort of acting as if there isn't this monumental task of keeping everybody in cruise ship settings safe, um, even with, you know, the vaccination mandate. And so we're getting people who are just like, oh, you know, we're res life, we're back to everything's final normal, you know, and like most of these are people who just returned to campus in August for the first time since last March. Um, and so that there's definitely that sense of exhaustion uh, in, in our team of being like, we, we never got to go home, um, many of us. And uh, so, um, you know, it is, no breaks is real um, right now. Yeah, Robin, I, I wanna make sure I acknowledge some of the great comments you have in the chat um, in regards to your custodial contractor. It's difficult for them also to find staff. Um, Transportation, yes, and being able to meet the requirements of the job, whether that's drug tests or otherwise, that's a, that's a good comment. Oh, lunch from Raising Cane. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, well, if there's things that folks think of, sometimes it's the little things and, and just pausing to acknowledge, like it, it is hard. It's hard and I, I see you. I'm real sorry. Um, and sometimes here's a chicken strip too. All right, so Bill, this was your time right here. Vendors, all right. So one of the things that came up was, was exactly what you said, Bill, was some challenges related to vendors. So this, was, this is not a, a, a screen to dog on vendors. It was just a fact that some folks were finding some challenges with vendors what, because they were having staffing challenges. Um, and then that was impacting project timelines. Um, so similar to exactly what you were sharing. So this was really for us to talk about strategies that folks were employing um, and how folks were handling that. Um, whether that is 
modifying um, agreements that you have for purchasing, um, putting some something into writing regarding timelines. I don't know. So really, this was 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 the same thing. So just want to open this back up. If there's some strategies that folks are planning to employ, um, whether this is vendors related to construction or vendors related to um, product. Well, I'd love to hear anything. I'll tell you. If, if you know, it, it's really been, as I said earlier, a, a challenge of ours. And, and, and I know I'm hoping all of you say something. I mean, we, we um, the, the problem is to talk about, Brill talks about like a sales pitch and, and that's not what this is about. I just know we take a lot of real care and concern um, uh, the project timeline this year, I, I can't imagine what it is for you because I know what we're running through our every scenario of every quote we do for next year. Um, we've already had um, uh, issues with some of our um, our wood and and uh, think just for December projects, believe it or not. I mean, we we had to we had a December December project need that the commodity was was a color and, and believe it or not, we, we couldn't get the color to deliver by December. They agreed to go with the natural product that we had uh, in inventory commodity wise, wood wise. So I, I just can't imagine what you all are challenged with right now, especially if you have a major renovation, a major, um, a, a, a major, a new construction project um, for, for next year, uh, yet this year, possibly next year, because um, I, I, I'm once again, I'm, we're just brill, but I, I, I would hope you're seeing, and especially we, we do have some domestic competitors that are wonderful competitors that all of you do business with too, that, um, I just can't imagine anything, anything coming from overseas right now. Somebody earlier had mentioned containers. Um, it just, it's, it's scary. What's trying to come into port right now. I, I, I we, we heard of a project that was supposed to install for an over for one of our competitors that does um, importing um, that that was supposed to be in eight weeks ago and it's still not even to port. So I, I just the challenges that you must be coming up against and um, there, there is a slight modification, but I'd like to not keep talking. I do have something that I, I was going to tell you all about we're doing that might help with modifications later if everybody. I think go for it, Bill. Well, I, I, one thing, one thing we have found that is really a neat part of um, how we're going to move forth with with our message to all of you is, we've actually found a group out of Chicago called the Chicago Furniture Bank. They were asked by the Akuho in Columbus for us to look into to see what we thought, and and if any of you have projects where there are renovations where you're getting rid of furniture. Uh, maybe renovating building and bringing in new. And by the way, this isn't buying bro furniture. This is just furniture. Um, they support and try to support up to 75 families a week in Chicago. Um, a lot of the um, housing here um, is a, a lot of it's government funded housing. They do a phenomenal job and we're going to try to partner with them. We're actually going to help sponsor a booth for them at a Hawaii next year in Orlando. APA was just a little too quick for us. But if any of you have any furniture that you're looking to get rid of, local charities or something that maybe they'll actually work with local charities, make sure they get what they want. And they're, they're just trying to find beds, chests, um, apart, old apartment furniture, anything at all that they can bring in. Um, it's, it's, it's a little like a group called, I think it's IDF, I think it is, or IRF um, that, that picks up furniture and ships it overseas where they're looking just to keep it here in Chicagoland. And help the families of Chicagoland. That um, so it's a really cool thing. So modification. How does that work? It's a sort of way we're modifying our sales presentation uh, to the schools and, and and private housing groups as we go into the future. We're trying to find a way that it doesn't hit the landfill, doesn't um, it, you know, does, just doesn't go to a landfill. We can keep uh, more of a um, uh, the cycle of life. We call a uh, you know it it. it I, uh, I'm sorry, Angela, I'm blanking. Um, circular economy. It's, it's just the point of it is it's just a concept of trying to use this furniture uh, instead of just seeing it head to a landfill. So just to sort of an FYI, how we're modifying the way we view business 
If you have furniture left over, you have you want to do something with it, don't hesitate to drop me a line and we'll try to get you in touch with them. So this isn't about Brill. This is about trying to help people who need furniture that a lot of times we don't know what to do with it. That's a great resource, Bill. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to watch our time. Um, we've kind of talked about this one as well with supply chain, the long lead item shortages and strategies. And so Dana, I appreciate your comments and Robin's on appliances. Um, I think someone mentioned copper. Um, are there other things that folks would want to comment on now that you're having some long lead item, long lead concerns um, or otherwise? It may just be on the west coast of Canada, but glass, anything glass is mm -hmm. taking forever. And in our all our new construction, our designers and our architects love to make everything glass. So. <laughs> we have so much hand sanitizer now. <laughs> Let me know if you want some. That's good. What, what else besides glass? Are there other things that folks um, are were surprised by that you haven't had before? Mm, yeah, doors. Josh, were you the one that had the door project that, hmm. No. Someone had a, a really, wild door project, but you, did you have the paint project? Yeah, we had a paint project that was a bid bust. Yeah. Which goes back again to staffing, right? They, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so no, th thank you, um, Spencer, for adding um, that comment. Um, ID cards are um, in shortage. And um, we had the issue with just doors being delayed. Um, doors in general have been hard for us, and so it only adds with pandemic pressure. Okay, um, let's see. Summer 22, camps and conferences. Seems crazy to think that it's that time, but I, we have another poll question. So let's see. I'm going to launch it now. All right, for summer of 22, do you anticipate your conference business will be similar to the summer of 19? which was our last pre-pandemic um, summer, will you have a continued reduced approach like we've had the last two years now, um, or you just don't know yet? Maybe you are still trying to get your building open, buildings open. So if you'll just take a moment and comment there what you think summer camps and conferences will look like. I think everybody's going to try and open full force. We'll go ahead and close our poll in three, two, one. Okay, so we, we have a pretty small response, but that's okay. Um, pretty much we're not certain right now, but I love seeing any response of a summer 19 approach because that just feels good for business, even if it, it needs to be done in a smart way, though. So I'm not pushing unsafe work. Um, so that's probably a poll that we'll continue to utilize in upcoming meetings just to continue to get a feel for how folks are moving towards this, this upcoming summer. Um, any comments that on what you're thinking about for summer of 22? Any projects, any um, changes based on how things are currently looking? Maybe you were planning to do a significant project but decided this isn't the right time because Contractors don't have staff. Okay. All right, summer turns. We'll keep moving. We don't have to talk about things if we don't have comments today. Um, so summer turns, one of the things that folks had asked, the question had come forward was, how do you make time for inspections between the summer use for your spaces and occupancy of your students for the academic year? Um, how, do you, how does that work for your campus? How do you fit it in? Uh, 
Are we talking about adjustments we've made because of the pandemic or just? Just how you do it in general, actually. Folks are just curious, how do others make the time to do the inspections before your fall students when you're so crushed with summer? We had to um, extend timelines because of COVID. Normally we tell our occupancy team, we need a minimum of three days to turn around. Um, our cleaners won't go near a room unless it's 72 hours past the last occupancy. I can't send my inspectors in till 72 pa hours past the last occupancy. So we went from a three day turnaround to a seven day turnaround, uh, which meant limitations on contract extensions, both late departures and early arrivals. Thank goodness we had no summer conference season because that would have just thrown everything awry, but I don't know what we're going to do next year when there's a, hopefully a summer conference season. And that three days, is that contractual with your vendor? It's, no, it's just a standard, our standard are operating. Um, we had to put some, some parameters on it or they were giving us two hours and that wasn't working. So <laughs> we, we have a maximum of about 10 days, 10 days to two weeks between terms. So we don't have a lot of wiggle room to begin with. And in that time, we're doing room switches, move outs, move ins, early contracts, late contracts, CAs showing up whenever res life feels like it, all the other stuff. So yeah. So it was just us trying to put some organization into it, not contractual. But the three days, the 72 hours for cleaning is now con contractual with our contractor. So they have told us they won't go in. Hey, Dana, have they given any thought, you know, and this is just me thinking out in order to reduce that back down. And I understand, okay, they don't want to go in 72 until 72 hours has passed. And one thing we've learned about all this COVID stuff is it's not really a contact spread. But um, one thing I do when I, we get an exposure in a room um, is I, I have my custodial staff. I have my own custodial staff. Um, one of them will go in the room. Um, within a, you know, within a day and fog it, they'll put on a Tyvek suit and a half face respirator and goggles and gloves and stuff. And they'll go in and they'll fog the room it only takes a few minutes. And then they'll go back in the next day um, and do a, you know, and they'll do a, a good thorough wipe down cleaning. So I don't know if that's an option that is have to reduce some of that time. That is how we've been operating for the last year is that we've been, we, we have purchased our own as, as well as our contract cleaning company has purchased the electrostatic sprayers right. and we're, we're pr pretty free with the spray. Um, this, thir this 72 hours is a new thing that their union has put out and they won't even go in to spray without 72 hours. Wow. They just told me this next, last week. I'm like, I don't know if that doesn't make sense to me, but okay. Yeah. Doesn't make sense to me either. Josh, how are you handling that in, in Washington? You know, we're, it's sort of a um, evolving target for us. Um, but we, we have now gotten, let's see, let me <laughs> situate where we are at this moment in time we we were doing 24 hours after that is still our ideal um but uh if we need to go in sooner than 24 hours we will do that with ppe we're not using a, a last um the the sprayers in student rooms because of the ppe requirements for those okay um, but it hasn't been a significant problem for us yet well, it's interesting with Dana's situation that the the vendor that she you're using there, you know, and it, and it's a union, it becomes a union issue. And I know we've I'm unionized here, 
Um, and they've had to do MOUs with, with the unions, but they haven't really touched upon that component of it. Yeah, um, we're, we're unionized, but it's in-house staff. Yeah, okay. Let me drop the link to our current protocol in the chat box. Um, love the conversation. I'm going to go ahead and, and um, get us to, to towards our wrap up here um, because we are coming up on three o'clock and I want to make sure I honor folks time. If you are interested again in, in getting connected on um, with this group on any of the mailings that come out, we would encourage you to email Joel or to complete that form that I put in the chat earlier. Um, our next meeting will be um, during fall conference is our, is our hope and our plan. Um, we do meet the third Monday of each month at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And so you're always welcome to join us um, for that time. And then, Wanted to um, make a plug for some job openings that we have on our campus and then open um, things up if folks have other positions they would like to share. Um, we have three key positions open at Missouri State. One is for our Director of Residence Life, Housing and Dining Services. Um, so this is the person who leads the whole team. Um, business services, facilities, and um, education and development. And so looking for um, someone in that role, it's a great position. Um, then we have our associate director for residence life facilities. Um, that's a position I was previously in. Again, another great position. And then an assistant director for residence life facilities. Um, so hope um, if you know of folks who would be good in those roles, um, please encourage them to apply. I will put our vacancy announcement um, link in the chat. It's a little bit long, um, but I tried to narrow it down to positions within housing for folks to be able to see those or shoot me an email. Would love to get folks connected. Um, Angela has also been a Missouri State Fair, so she can comment on it being a great place to be. Um, and so I can speak to folks about, you know, what is cost of living like, what is the department and campus culture like, but three really great positions for folks to consider um, who are looking for some, some different next steps. And I'd like to open it up if others have positions um, that you would like to share. Okay, well. Um, just want to make sure that we're providing that space for folks. I um, appreciate you joining us again. Um, we will meet again for sure on the third Monday of November. Plan to connect also during the October fall conference. Reach out to your um, department head if you have not heard about registration because we'd love to see folks um, at the fall conference series. I appreciate folks being here. I appreciate your comments um, and let me know what you need. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you.